Last year, Vox released this video called How Spider-Verse Forced Animation to Evolve, where they detailed the rise of new art styles in animated films and the breakaway from the more popular photorealistic renderings that often dominate the cultural zeitgeist. For lack of a better term, I find this return to form fascinating because we're starting to see much more experimentation occur alongside big film releases and be accepted into the mainstream. Now it wasn't like there were never animations that pushed the boundary, but in recent years we've had somewhat of a renaissance with works like Klaus, I Lost My Body, Arcane, and of course Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse that are all told with much more 2D elements and stylization. Enter Galactic is another such film that continues this new foray into animation. On first glance, it certainly does have a lot of similarities with Into the Spider-Verse, from the offset frame rate to its painterly textures, but there are also a lot of subtle differences that I want to explore in this video. The first half is going to be a regular art analysis where we'll take a look at everything that went into achieving the film's look, and the second half is going to be an interview with its production designer, Rob Ruppel. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Rob also worked in Into the Spider-Verse, and it was certainly interesting hearing about the design philosophies between both productions. By the way, there will be zero spoilers for Intergalactic in this video, so I hope you enjoy. Intergalactic was created by Scott Mescudi, aka Kid Cudi, and is pretty unique in its conception. The main driving force for Intergalactic was to create something that would serve as a visual companion piece to Cuddy's album of the same name. The film's visuals are an expression of its music, manifesting in Cuddy's signature neo-psychedelia and trip-hop beats through vivid, ethereal scenes. The story itself centers around a 20-something-year-old artist named Jabari as he moves into Manhattan and falls for his neighbor Meadow. As described by the film's director Fletcher Mools, it's about an analog love story in an increasingly digital age. The themes of modern dating, love and optimism, and black culture all stem from Kid Cudi's music that he played when he was pitching the show. Originally, the story was passed around as a live action series that would feature a standalone animated episode, but executive producer Kenya Barris suggested doing it entirely animated. Not only would animation give them a unique way to express and capture the emotions from the music, but also allow more freedom in its visual storytelling. As they were looking for inspiration and what kind of art style they wanted, director Fletcher Mulls came across the works of Michal Safteruk, who would go on to serve the film as art director. Safteruk's works captured a beautiful mix of heavy and loose brushstrokes, while being super saturated and having a strong sense of texture. Being aware of the growing trend of stylized animation, Fletcher Mulls wanted to take Antigalactic in a fresh direction, developing some initial ground rules for the crew. Some of them included the feeling of everything being handmade, not having spline animations, no in-betweens, no capping, and everything being on a step, with every movement in the animation being a deliberate choice. For example, one of the major differences between Intergalactic and Into the Spider-Verse is that Spider-Verse is trying to emulate a moving comic book movie, with half-tone printing and line work prevalent on the screen, but Intergalactic is expressed through a painterly aesthetic with visible brushstrokes and color banding that gives it a unique flavor. This look didn't come out of nowhere, as over the course of its three-year development, a lot of care and consideration was placed on developing the visuals of Intergalactic. Early VizDev illustrations showcased the kind of approach and color palette and style the team had in mind, with a focus on strong silhouettes of objects and abstracting complex details into visual noise. An example of this is the scene when Jabari is talking to his friends Jimmy and Kai. Notice how the background is painted and simplified, with something as detailed as leaves being rendered as effectively one giant mass. We can see the expressive strokes and colors all over this tree, and this works to convey the essence of the subject without needing specifics. But it's not just solid objects that are given this treatment, as even light bands out and emanates from various flat circles to showcase their glow. This continues giving Intergalactic a hand-painted feel, as even soft objects are shown as having a sense of purpose and tactility. What's particularly interesting is that many of the film's locations were not based on an interpretation of New York City, but on very real places instead. In fact, DNEG Animation, who were responsible for the animations and 3D models, downloaded a virtual map of Manhattan and blocked out various routes Jabari would visit while riding his bike. This decision was made because the team wanted the film to feel grounded, and by showing real locations like Chinatown, or the iconic NYC skyline, or even real restaurants helped segment this realism further. Though in more of the surreal scenes, Jabari sometimes finds himself out in space, which reflects his own mindset and how he perceives his world. 
These moments take full advantage of animation as a medium, blending together the realism and surrealism in a way that sets the tone for the rest of the film. This interplay of realism and stylization also applies to the characters themselves, as although they are rendered in graphic shapes with hard brush strokes, their fashion was a huge consideration, which is typically uncommon in traditional animation. Characters change their clothes throughout the story, as days pass or when they go out at night, expressing themselves fully with their clothing styles. When designing characters, fashion designer Virgil Abloh approached it as if it were live action, and this gives audiences another way to connect to the people in the story and their lives. From Meadow's down-to-earth hippie aesthetic to the hypebeast lens of Jabari, every article of clothing was deliberately chosen. Similarly, the character likenesses are intentionally designed to look like their actors, which helped the animation team by using video references of their performances. To stay within this graphic style, characters are depicted with hard lights and shadows, and strokes of color variations and texture are present throughout their entire models. A huge challenge at DNEG Animation was effectively breaking their entire production pipeline to accommodate this new look, which was far different from what they as a studio were used to. It wasn't enough to just paint graphic textures onto the model and leave it at that. As animation director Kapil Sharma and VFX supervisor Archie Donato noted, a lot of work went into maintaining this 2D field when the characters would speak and emote. A great advantage of animation is that there is flexibility to visual storytelling, and throughout the film we catch glimpses into the point of view of other characters when they share their experiences with love. Intergalactic doubles down on this by changing the animation style entirely, from Kai's hilarious story about a Russian hacker, to Karina's first date in Ninja New York, and downtown Pat's brief fling with a woman at a rave. These sequences were handled by Titmouse Animations, and they bring a sense of levity and a new perspective on the show without it being forced, especially if it was live action. There are also several gags throughout the film where diegetic words become non-diegetic, and these help signal to the audience the subtext of the scene while fully embracing the advantages of animation. This kind of playful expression is also reflected in the film's frame rate, where characters aren't just animated on twos, meaning every second frame like Into the Spider-Verse, but in addition, threes and fours, and it all depends upon what the emotion of the scene is calling for. For example, the nightmare sequence with Mr. Rager is animated in ones, which leads the scene feeling a little bit more fluid and dynamic, and this highlights just a small part of the experimentation and care that went into the making of Intergalactic. In fact, DNEG Animation had a running joke throughout the project which was to remove the stink of CG. The last thing I want to briefly examine is the use of colour and light in Intergalactic. As the film was developed alongside the album, its music played a huge role in the kind of colours used. There are lots of purples being used in a lot of the scenes which adds a sense of coolness and relaxation, but this is also contrasted by the warm golden tones that we see especially during the day scenes, and alongside the soundtrack, helps to reinforce the vibe of Kid Cudi's music feeling spacey and, dare I say it, intergalactic. Ooh, nice! But just like the example I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of play between color variations that are left with brushstrokes, with that kind of messiness and spontaneity you get from traditional handmade paintings. The color choices are pushed and exaggerated, which helps to elevate New York City into a character of its own. Colors are also used in full effect to help stage the scenes and by bringing attention to characters or objects. Again, while based in reality, Intergalactic pushes its style and creates a heightened version of realism. Some of these are just for visual clarity like having rim lights separate a character in the background, but others are also used to highlight an important story moment. I find that one of the quotes towards the end of the film summarizes it pretty well. And it just gets me tight that people equate New York with grey and darkness when the city's mad colorful. Like even the people are so colorful. So in my work, I try to showcase that. While I was making this video, I reached out to production designer Rob Ruppel, who was in charge of overseeing all of the character and environment designs and anything visual. Rob is an industry veteran whose projects include Into the Spider-Verse, Love, Death and Robots, and even video games such as Uncharted. Wanting to try out Intergalactic's art style myself, I will also occasionally be showing a demo of me painting Perth's skyline during this interview, incorporating a lot of the visual design and colour philosophy I mentioned throughout my analysis. I really hope you enjoyed this interview and I'll be posting our full conversation on my channel soon. First question I want to ask is, you're listed as the creative director for Intergalactic, but I assume that your role encompasses a lot of different things and could you walk me through a little bit about your influence on Intergalactic and the things that you did day to day? I wonder if they have different credits where you are because uh, here I'm listed as production designer. 
And so what that means is you oversee all the visuals. So everything from character design to environment design to lighting, helping out with the staging, um, helping out with the matte paintings, everything that has anything to do with any kind of visual. What was your favorite aspect of that? Was there anything in particular that you really enjoyed? All of it, because um, on a project like this, you get to be involved with every single aspect of it, down to making the main character look as appealing as possible, to getting the color maps to be um, as interesting and as stylized as possible, all the shapes and the sculpting of the characters, all the all the lighting and how to tell a story through light and color. Uh, every bit of it is, uh, and that's what's so great about the job is you get to do a little bit of everything on it. So did you oversee different teams of artists and, and various people that worked on the project? Yeah, yeah. You just sort of like orchestrate the character designers, the background designers, uh, anyone doing 2D art, um, and then the modelers and the texture painters and the lighters on the DNEG side as well. And they did, a, they did an amazing job. Um, coming up with ways to sort of like break the pipeline. Um, their CG supervisor, Archie was fantastic. The whole crew did a, did an amazing job um, wanting and trying to bring this idea of something different to fruition because it would have been so easy for somebody to go, no, we can't do it. Or, you know, Oh, it's going to take too long. And just sort of like, you know, halfway do it and then the look isn't quite well you know but no they did an amazing job it's interesting um if i recall correctly intergalactic was in production for about three years or so which is pretty fast yeah yeah exactly especially for the quality of animation and just uh, the amount of work that would go into it at the start and one thing specifically with that graphic reduction style which i guess can be applied here is that you know you start with the the macro and work, work all the way down to the micro in terms of details. So when beginning a project like this, what's sort of the ideas that are floating around and how do you funnel into that, you know, tiniest details of putting everything together? Well, the director wanted to make a film that looked like the concept art that you see in the books. And so many times the concept art is just done by really great artists who aren't thinking about the render style. They're not worried about that. They're just painting in the style that they like and they're accustomed to. Uh, the director's idea was to make, was to get as much of that on the screen as possible. So the big trick was really rethinking lighting and CG rendering. We really didn't want all that stuff that they normally put on. We don't want Fresnel. We don't want subsurface. We don't want AO. We don't want all those things that make it look like CG. In fact, we want it to look like a painting. So the best way to do that is to take away as much as possible that they've developed in the past 10 and 20 years that makes CG so convincing now because we didn't want it to look uh, photoreal or um, anything that looked like uh, that kind of um, hyper-realistic rendering that you see on everything nowadays. How much of the pre-production stage about all the concepts stays the same and how much of it evolves as you kind of explore the project as it moves along? No, we had, a, we had a, we had an absolutely clear idea of what we wanted to achieve from the beginning. And it was, it was merely a matter of, you know, getting everybody to rethink um, how they were used to approaching stuff. And we hired, we hired concept artists that were already doing a graphic style. So it wasn't a matter of like retraining anybody. It's like, this person already does this. This is this person that will be great for the character design. This person already understands this. This person will be great for um, helping us with environments. And then taking all that great uh, artwork in terms of showing props and environments that they would then build and model from. The way that I can kind of describe it, maybe for lack of a better term, is like it, it's going back to a grassroots feel of animation where it's 2D and hand drawn and those like little imperfections make their way onto the screen. And I guess it's, it's a thing almost of like the limitations of technology at the time versus being a creative decision now, which I find really interesting. No, that's absolutely right. We used a lot of 2d trickery too, in terms of simplifying settings, in terms of simplifying camera moves, even in terms of simplifying how we thought about stuff. You know, we never wanted to run a simulation. We never wanted to 
make things look hyper real. Here's a good example. When the camera is racing across the, the Hudson River and it catches up with Jabari on the other side, we didn't want a CG rendered water surface that had all the undulations. We just wanted it to look like somebody painted it. And the easiest way to do that is to put a bunch of cards, 90 degrees to a flat card, but um, facing camera. And then you put the tiniest little bit of uh, animation onto those animating waves, just a little bit of movement to them. And you do hundreds of those things. And it looks like a very convincing painted water surface that the camera can move through in 3D space, but it's not a simulation in any way whatsoever. It is merely 2D hand-painted cards on a flat 2D surface that just happen to be facing camera. Are there any shots that are completely just like hand-drawn or is it all done sort of in engine that's using all of those different texture maps and things like that to appear 2D? Well, all, all the main characters are 3D. We have lots of 2D background characters that are literally painted cards with a little bit of movement on them. And unless Jabari is moving through Z space, like unless he's riding his bike through the city and unless there's a lot of reuse in the location, most of that stuff is 2d. If there's a one-off of like, for example, when he's riding his bike through uh, central park, both the happy time with meadow and the sad time by himself, that's all 2d paintings mapped onto cards. When he's going down the city in the beginning, there's a little bit more 3D geometry in that because he's moving faster, the camera's moving with him. But on scenes like the one I just described with him in Central Park, yeah, we just we can do it with cards. And that's how it was done in 2D features for decades. Especially with Spider-Verse, which kind of opened, uh, I guess, to the mainstream, this, this new idea of thinking about animation, as you mentioned deviating away from what was already been done for the last decade or so. Do you think that animation itself as, as a medium now has gone back into that more experimental type of figuring out different ways of visually showing stories? Well, I think, you know, filmmakers like Alberto and Robert Valley have shown that you can still tell a very compelling story in a very different way and um, have people respond to it. And I think that's what's really important. So it doesn't have to be rendered in a particular way in order to get, to get people to watch it anymore. Um, not that it ever did, but, you know, back when Pixar was first doing their films, they were amazing. They were stunning. And everyone wanted to do that. And then as we got more accustomed to that, and as they got more sophisticated, then there's, there's sort of a, you know, um, homogenization of everything. It's like, oh, okay, I, I've seen that before. What can we do? Well, you know, we can veer to the left a little bit or veer to the right a little bit and go back to something that's more stylized. Earlier on Instagram, we, we kind of mentioned or touched upon the subtle differences between Intergalactic and Spider-Verse, which I'd like to get into now. And Spider-Verse having that really soft kind of lighting versus Intergalactic, which is a lot more graphic and harsh and without any of the uh, halftone printings or lines. And could you talk a little bit about those differences and what you were thinking of when creating? Yeah, having having worked on both, I was really aware of making something that needed to look different than Spider-Verse for a lot of reasons. Spider-Verse was an homage to comic books. So it was halftone printing. It was offset um, printing to mimic depth of field. Um, it was line work to mimic comics. And since we're not making an homage to comics, we wanted our stuff to feel like a painting. We wanted the brushstrokes to show. We wanted the sharpness and the graphicness of paint to play a role. And so soft lighting was going to destroy that. Um, you know, and the, 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 the halftone and the offset, we just didn't need it. We weren't doing a comic book. So I, I would say other than like have both stories having a, a black um, main character in New York City, I think the looks are very different. The minute you have soft fall off and soft lighting and soft shading, it doesn't feel graphic anymore. It doesn't feel like a, a strong singular visual idea. It feels like a rendering. And so we always, always wanted to avoid that. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's one of the things I noticed is especially in any kind of lighting, physical light in intergalactic, whether it be a light bulb or a street post or whatever, like the, the, um, the radiation of the light is in very specific 
I had this, you know, yeah, circles very, are very shaped graphic, like that. And, very graphic representation. Rather than having soft fall off and soft bloom, it's like, no, we can get that same idea across with very sharp graphic, you know, concentric circles that do the same thing, but just in a more um, more uh, structural way. Yeah. What, what would you say were some of the challenges working on, on the project? Um, gosh, I... I I, the challenges were just keeping the consistency, but everyone did such a good job um, from our viz dev artists to the DNEG side that the only challenge was like keeping on top of the quality. But I never felt like we had to like ride people in a bad way. It was it was more about you know, like, nope, back up a little bit and simplify. Nope, make sure that this shows up. You know, like, nope, don't, nope, too much, too complex, too busy, right? Simplify, simplify, keep it. Keep it graphic. Whenever we're doing props or things like that, you know, when you take a very, very complex 3D model and you put a th simulated 3D light on it, every little nook and cranny and dent and bevel is going to show you uh, a shadow or a form or, you know, some sort of bit of information. So we don't want a highly complex surface. We want something that feels like the paintings. So all the models were very, very simplified. And, uh, you know, if you were to look at them without much of the textures on, you'd be like, wow, that's it. That's all that's underneath that. Holy cow. When we're walking down the street, we're not aware of the concrete texture. We're not aware of the frame around every window and how it's catching a light and the bevel. You know, we're aware of the overall impression. It's the, it's the impression over the details. And so using that thinking all the models and all the texture maps had to sort of follow that philosophy of impression over details. Um, something I'm curious about you, Rob, is at this point in your career, what kind of things are you looking for in projects and what sort of excites you now versus like maybe, you know, uh, 10 years ago, for instance? Intergalactic is going to be hard to top because it's just, I use the, um, I use the analogy of a flying a parabola. And when you go up in these planes and you do the the, par the parabolic arc and you're, wait you're weightless, you know, they can only do it for so long, right? You're only wait wait weightless for so long, but it's an amazing feeling. And intergalactic was like that. It's like, oh, man, once in a decade, something like this comes along where everything just works. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of time, but that didn't matter. And it was just it was a wonderful weightless feeling. And then, you know, it comes back to that and it's like, all right, well, I just have to wait for that next weightless feeling. But what I'm looking for, I don't know, at some, at some point, um, you know, it's also who you're working with. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's what do I like my team? Is my team fun? Do we get, do we get along? You know? But not every great piece of work comes from, you know, uh, lots, of, lots of times great pieces of art come from conflict. Not that you're looking ever for conflict, but it's that, it's that, that subtle balance of tension, you know, you, you want, uh, what's a, what's another bad analogy? I can think of like a race, maybe, you know, like you train and train and train for the race, but you can't control everything on race day. You know, maybe it's rained, maybe you didn't sleep well or whatever. So you always want a great race day, but you can't control every aspect of it. A special thanks once again to Rob Ruppel for sitting down to chat to me. The art achievement that is intergalactic continues to push mainstream animation in this new trend of stylization in 2D. Through its use of painted textures, exaggerated colors and style, I actually look forward to this new era of films and I can't wait to see where the industry goes next. So with that being said, what do you think about intergalactic and how it blended music and animation together? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Until next time everyone, take care and stay safe.